Hi, and welcome to 10 Ideas 50 Years, uh, video number 6. I'm Jeff Cliff. I'm trying to get across to you 10 ideas that I think are important, that you should know. Uh, and this is a not intended to be a deep uh, introduction to the mathematics and proofs behind game theory, but I'm just trying to get across the ideas that are core to how the past 50 years or so have developed and uh, hopefully uh, you'll, you'll find some value in this. Today uh, we're going to be talking about a paper uh, by one John Carsagni and Richard Selton, which you may remember Carsagni uh, from one of the previous videos. Uh, this is a yet another uh, paper uh, that came out of the International Game Theory Workshop in Jerusalem in 1965. Uh, in particular, this one uh, is a little bit perhaps more interested and in fact cites uh, some of the workshops uh, that were involved in trying to reduce the amount of nuclear arms that the United States and the Soviet Union were uh, had at the time. And so th this is a uh, kind of a, a th this idea kind of lies on the borderlands a little bit between economics and game theory. And it's going to get a little bit brutal. Uh, it's, it's not as mathematical uh, as some of the other ideas uh, in its nature. Although the proofs do get very detailed, and we're not going to go into them, uh, but it's it, it, the, there, there's kind of a nickname for economics as the dismal science, and this stuff is going to get pretty dismal. So hopefully, it deserves to be uh, included in that. And so, but you have to understand that, it, like some of the previous videos, uh, th this came out of a very tense time, and the the idea of how to survive a potential global conflict. Uh, where you, all of humanity, could very easily be wiped out uh, if certain things follow other certain things uh, in a very non-intuitive way. So the, the idea of trying to, to model the, the entirety of the problem and to, to work our way out of the worst possible outcomes uh, is something that's incredibly valuable and is something that they were trying to do. So the, the, the question... Uh, th this this paper, a generalized solution for two-person bargaining games, of uh, incomplete information. Uh, th this solution is going to during the last video we, we saw. Uh, the idea of commitment comes into play, where you actually have to kind of choose ahead of time whether or not you're going to follow through with the optimal strategy, even if it ends up screwing you. Um, and where the the outcome of that strategy, even in in, or in the middle of the game, you can tell that it's not going to work out for you. Whether or not you stick to that strategy determines, uh, uh, both in individual and for multiple iterated games, a great deal about the game. One of the things that uh, we're going to start out uh, that's new for this paper is that the idea that this difference isn't necessarily uh, a binary thing, where it's you either commit or you don't commit. Uh, one of the things that they're going to take for granted is that you can have a, a entire spectrum of commitment uh, of, of varying different levels. And they give some examples of situations where uh, you could potentially model uh, as a game uh, with a certain amount of commitment, uh, ranging from fixed commitments, where you make up your mind to follow the strategy immediately and there's nothing really you can do about it uh, to change after the fact. Uh, for example, if you're in a dictatorship, and your you know, king or your dictator decides something, uh, you know, you're, you're going to follow that. Uh, and unless the dictator changes his mind, if the dictator doesn't change his mind, uh, then you're basically as good as stuck in a situation where you've committed, uh, or if you're stuck in a strategy where you've committed better or worse. Uh, another example they gave is a hiring situation, where you know, if you go to a job interview and they decide to hire you or not, that's going to be something that they're going to of course, they can fire you later, but the decision to fire you is something that cannot be undone, uh, or at least cannot be undone without greater context being involved, i.e. firing, usually in some jurisdictions with just cause. Uh, another example is the point of sale, where if you are offering a good or a service as a company, and you put a price out and a person accepts that price, that is a strategy that is now accepted, or, or, or can be viewed in terms of strategies uh, where you cannot undo the choice after that fact. Uh, so pretty much once you are in the marketplace and after a certain point of commitment, you're basically stuck uh, 
actually being part of that market and your strategy cannot change after that point. The, the alternative, uh, more flexible uh, points where your strategy can be changed after the fact right, and where the player can change its mind uh, as far as which strategy they're going to employ, uh, examples given in the paper are, uh, as in the previous video, and kind of for review, uh, democratic institutions where you can kind of re-vote or vote to change the bylaws uh, to varying degrees, uh, arms and labor, or, or, or arms conflicts where you can, as in the case of the Soviet Union and the United States, where both can manufacture more nuclear weapons or, or re reduce, but they can generally change their mind uh, as for how they're approaching the problem as they go. Uh, same thing with labor disputes as well, where uh, labor disputes uh, tend to be the decisions you can make, uh, you, you can typically undo them. And so this paper is going to mostly look at the fixed, uh, what fixed threats or fixed strategies, where you can um, say what your strategy is going to be uh, with or upheld and uh, continually applied. Uh, and in specific, that they're going to look at finite games, uh, but with incomplete information. So. Uh, this, this may also be true for other kinds of games, uh, but that is going to, going to be their focus. Uh, so the, the other uh, kind of caveat is they, they split apart um, You are our first thing that these games are going to be able to, or that you're going to be able to tune to some degree in different kinds of games is the level of commitment to strategy. The second thing is going to be whether or not uh, you can accept or reject or do both at once. That's something that's new to this, potentially new to this paper as well. Uh, so there may be cases where you can accept a strategy, but where you cannot reject the strategy, and vice versa. So for example, uh, if you uh, are kind of proposing something uh, in a labor dispute, uh, you may be able to reject it uh, and to continue to reject it. Uh, but acceptance may be final. So once you accept it, it may, con it may contain some kind of a legal clause where you are forced to continue accepting. Uh, terms of services and websites often have a, you know, if you accept it, you accept any other further changes. That's going to be kind of along the lines of an Uh, another thing, uh, this is going to be is that players are probably going to be playing with chance games, like models of games uh, that are split apart, and so that you're basically playing based on a flip of like a, a dice or a flip of coin or, or a spin of a roulette. As discussed in previous videos, this is tends to be an optimal way of, or allows you to, to find optimal ways of playing and optimal ways of generating which strategy uh, among the strategies you, you feel are potentially acceptable uh, you can play such that you can end up playing the game uh, in a uh, somewhat optimal way. So there's going to be, uh, we're, we're going to do this uh, in three, uh, we're, we're going to kind of describe what this, this paper does in about three parts. Uh, and the, uh, again, the reminder is that this is mostly related to a, a single iteration game, and the full iteration games may be different. Uh, and there is subtleties involved in multiple games that they don't even want to touch with a 10 foot core. But, So they don't discuss it in these terms, uh, but in Neil Stevenson's book, Anathem, uh, there's a concept called a hem space, which is more or less what they're discussing. Uh, and I find that their uh, kind of view of it is, uh, is inferior to Neil Stevenson. So if you want to kind of find a description of a hem space, you'll probably be a lot better off than trying to wrap your head around this paper without it. Um, so the, the basic idea behind hem space is that 
there are states that you can that a physical system can be in. A, a physical system that can be uh, that cause and effect can take place in uh, such that there are transitions between these states. Basically, these lines between states, and that you you start in some state and you move within that state, and it's possible to transition to another state. Uh, may seem pretty simple, uh, but the, the kind of geometry involved, you, you can change how the, what is meant by uh, kind of distance, you can change by whether certain points within these states serve as uh, attractors, uh, all sorts of fruitful things come from it. But if, if you view just your process, or, or your problem uh, and outcomes involved, or the or the states within the game that you're playing, uh, in, in terms of a, a, a kind of visual map where you can transition from one to the other, uh, it, it, it is it, it does turn out to to be true. So uh, th this again isn't all that much different from a problem space, uh, but but it's a, it, it's a, it's a kind of a generalized state space and. Uh, they're going to use something like it to uh, to prove what they're going to end up proving. Now, specifically, uh, we are going to want to know uh, the the paths that our opponent could move through this space, and the the ones that the, the opponent could choose and the ones that uh, specifically are going to be the, I guess, the, the combination of those two. Uh, and so the ones that both the opponent can move and that the opponent can potentially choose uh, one way or the other. And so this is not the same as the entirety of all reachable spaces within the game. It's just kind of a subset of that that the opponent is actually going to uh, or a, a path within that, or, or a set of paths within that, that the opponent can actually move. So something like that, where you have a, a, a you start with the entirety of all possible states that the game can be in, you, you constrict it by the ones that the opponent can possibly move, and then you constrict that by the, the ones that the opponent could possibly want to or, or in, would move in relation to your moves, or potential moves. So that, that's kind of the first constraint. Uh, and then the second constraint is that the moves, both that we're going to make and that our opponent are going to make, should satisfy at least one of us. Uh, if a move satisfies neither of us, we shouldn't make it. Uh, and this is not... This is something we should kind of trim from our, our decision trees or our, our, our possible uh, outcomes um, to varying degrees. And we're, we're going to kind of look for ways of how to do that. Uh, the, the, the kind of metaphor that I've kind of come up with is, is that if, if we're both to the point where we're rolling around in pig shit, uh, we should both notice that we're doing this and we should stop and we should you know, maybe play a different game or something. Uh, but to the extent that it's possible to stop, uh, you should actually do it at that point. It might sound kind of obvious, but if you're modeling in terms of a kind of high-level view of things, you know, you don't just want the, the, the paths that the opponent, you know, would be willing to do, but uh, kind of a, a mutual uh, understanding of terrible situations should be possible to embed directly into our model. Uh, this so, for example, uh, absolute mutual destruction should absolutely be outright removed from our model, or, or, or at least the outcomes that can lead to that and any action that will lead us there uh, should uh, at least uh, on this level be removed. However, it's only in the case of mutual action that this is the case. So if if you are again going back to the rolling around in pig shit idea, if you and you know someone you're you're fighting with have have you know gotten into a, a, a roll, you, you roll over the, the bar and you fall into the pig shit, you find you're still fighting. If you have the ability to mutually stop, 
you should stop. But if you neither of you have the ability to mutually stop, then it does not make sense to stop because if you stop, the other person is just going to take that as an uh, advantageous time to you know, hit you in the face or whatever. Uh, but uh, so, so this points out so something that's important about that, which is that you have to be able to negotiate uh, within each space uh, and that this turns out to be important in the case that there are spaces that you both do not want to be in. So again, going back to nuclear weapons, uh, if it is possible that both sides could get to the point of nuking each other, then at the point where they are nuking each other, they have to be able to communicate right before that point. They have to be able to still have the option of mutually deciding not to be in the state they're in and to go back to the previous state or to stop at that state and not progress further. Communication is absolutely the key in that situation. Uh, another key uh, thing is, so one is One, you need to be able to communicate if you're in the space where you both do not want to be or very close to it with the possibility of falling into it. Two, you have to be aware of which state you're in so that in the event that you are in a bad state that you can notice you're in a bad state or at least that you're close to it. Three, you have to be able to think ahead. So you have to be able to model the situation. You have to be able to utilize chance wins. You have to be able to notice that you can fall into this state where you do not want to be in. And four, you have to be able to bargain. You have to be able to make a credible case uh, where you're able to uh, improve or, or not improve your situation and possibly uh, change the, the state of your opponent as well. So you can view this as your partic particular state or your particular time space. And your opponent is going to have another one. You need to be able to have a corresponding change in both states or, or both spaces not necessarily of the same kind, but at least something that you can bargain with so that you do not fall into the, you know, proverbial pig shit. So, uh, the, the last thing of this kind of first section here is that uh, we want to uh, be able to communicate, we want to be able to bargain so that we can avoid the worst of the worst cases. But if we can get to the best of the worst cases, so the, the, of the cases that are unacceptable to uh, both of us, uh, what one thing we can do is we can aim for the best of those worst cases. And so, for example, in the, the Cold War, there may be a point where you could not necessarily, you know, nuke each other, but you can get to the point where you're both destroying each other mutually in a satisfactory way for both parties. So both parties get to save face, both parties get to basically lose, but it's, it's the least bad outcome of the bad outcomes that are possible. The, the, this paper is going to suggest that a, a way to, to, to guarantee or to, to force a path, uh, in many cases, uh, where you can get to this least worst case. What, what is this solution? And so there's going to be two subcases that we're going to want to be concerned with. The first subcase is going to be cases that uh, does not involve someone getting utterly screwed or utterly fucked over. So if you're in a business deal and you are capable of reaching a meeting of minds and you're not uh, outright destroying somebody's career or reputation or business, 
uh, th this is kind of an out outcome that is good. Uh, we, we of course want to always get to these, uh, but it turns, you know, th this is a, a beyond reachable um, in, in principle by communicating by you know, bargaining you know, that is kind of has a positive sum uh, you know, outcome in, in terms of the game. Uh, that, that is going to be one of the sub subcases of the solution. And the uh, other subcases, uh, cases where this is not the, tr the case, where, some, where things spiral out of control, where you reach some level of conflict, um, and that you're, you're basically at the point where, where things are going. Uh, rational players will tend to find a solution to this conflict if it involves an equilibrium, but there may be cases where there are no equilibriums. And so even a rational player, uh, if there is no equilibriums, you cannot find an equilibrium. You just spiral completely out of control, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the case of an equilibrium, an equilibrium doesn't have to be pleasant. It doesn't have to be a good uh, outcome. It just has to be stable and acquirable. The emphasis is on acquirable. You have to actually be able to get there and the, the, the question that this paper is going to ask is how do we get there? Uh, so, so of these three states, you know, the first one, you know, we can we can want it all we want, but if the space is set up such that we cannot actually get there with both players playing with the strategies that they have, then you know that we're, we're going to have to do the best we can with what we have. And if you're you're rational, you're going to get to the subcase where one of you is screwed, but at least it's a stable situation. And if there are no stable situations, then things just get completely out of control. There's nothing that you could do anyway, even if you are, in fact, rational. So, uh, and, you know, this one and this one can get pretty bad. Uh, like, we're, we're, we're talking all the way ranging from uh, your equations just not working out to active trench warfare and nuclear war. Um, this is, you know, the, the, the most depressing outcome you can imagine, but it's still uh, one where, you know, there, there are more unimaginable, unimaginable ones that are still lying underneath it here. So this is our goal. This is where we want the solution to lead us is pretty much this, this, this stable space, this equilibrium space where, you know, both players are, are, are in places where they do not want to be, but it's the best place of the places that both players do not want to be. Now, uh, up until this point, you know, we're, we're basically expressing what our solution should look like uh, and kind of how uh, bad it's going to be or how potentially bad it's going to be, etc. But the core of this paper is not necessarily you know, all that stuff. It's this, basically they've come up with a list of axioms that a solution has to obey in order for us to guarantee the above, i.e. the, the the, if you are rational, that you can get to an equilibrium point if you use this solution. Uh, that is what they're getting. At. It's not even necessarily to, you know, if, if, if there's a positive way, if there's a way of getting, you know, uh, to the, the, you know, nobody getting screwed over, it should get us there too. But what we're really concerned about is getting to that equilibrium point if things cannot get to that point. And so the first thing, uh, the first axiom is that the solution has to be better than that worst case scenario.
they call this the profitability assumption, uh, which is that you're ba basically just a a as explained above, that the solution has to actually guarantee that you won't just continue to spiral out of control into these worse and worse outcomes and, and these worse and worse spaces, uh, that you actually do have to guarantee that the solution that this is going to the come up with uh, as is, I guess, a tool used by both players who are rational or not, will actually get, in the event that it's possible, to a, an equilibrium space. The worst, or the least of the worst bad, or at least in this, in the case of this assumption, better than the absolute worst uh, conflict scenario, or, or the, the, unacceptably, the unacceptably bad conflict scenarios. So the second uh, axiom that they're going to use is that this is the optimal path for both sides to take. Now, this is going to seem like we're basically trying to beg the question a little bit, uh, and that we're trying to assume what we're proving, but their, I guess, assumption is a little bit different than their conclusion. We don't know what the path is. Uh, we, don't, we, we just want to make sure that we actually take it. Uh, and so. It's it's not or it's self-evident that if you know the right path, uh, that the solution will be to take that right path. But uh, if you are if you assume um, if, if, if 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 the the path is defined in the right way, uh, and if we define the steps in the right way, uh, we can get to a proof that of what we're starting from to where we want to go. Uh, and where, where we want to go is find in such a right way that you can actually define your path through this thing. So, it is, it, it's hazily, it, basically you're going to have to find your perfect path with something kind of missing so that the proof can kind of fill it out so that you're not just begging the question. And in this case, uh, has to be better than the worst conflict scenario is, is much, actually much more of a kind of a, an assumption of begging the question than this one in terms of how they actually do it. But, but in principle, uh, you, you basically have to be able to, 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 to give a reason, uh, or, or rather that this is going to say that if we have a path, we have to have a reason to believe that it's the perfect one. So, so it's basically a requirement that the solution we have ends up being a solution, if that makes sense. As discussed in previous videos, uh, Harsanyi uh, will, will basically view games in terms of players that are not necessarily the two players that are playing, but in terms of those players along with the context that they could possibly be, be in, or, or along with the information that they could possibly be in. This is going to be the defeating the incomplete information, the, the defeating the inf incomplete information of something, where you're not just playing against a player, but you're playing with a player uh, with a particular disp disposition, a player with a particular disposition today, a player who is, you know, e in a particular mindset, and you're basically playing against potential players with subtly different mindsets or subtly different backgrounds or s I I things that you 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 can predict that that player could uh, have been through or could believe. And so th this is a, a super set of your possible players. And the solution that we're going to come up with has to be good for all of them. That is the, the, the kind of one, one of the things that is going to be new here, and that it, it has to be invariant to the type of player that is actually going to be involved with that strategy. And so this is going to be uh, kind of constraining the, the possible strategies that could possibly work for this.
The fourth assumption is that if you are on a part of the path that is optimal through this space that this solution is going to give you, that you cannot actually have a, a, a branch off where a solution is better, or, or, or specifically that it appears better, um, that this solution has to actually guarantee that at any given point you're going to continue to follow it because your incentives are not going to divert you in any direction. This is probably one of the most constricting assumptions you can think of because this is going to restrict you to things where you're, you're ba basically forced to, to act. And so your agency is removed at this point because you have optimal it is, you know, it's best if you doesn't matter who you are and you're going to follow. So the, uh, I guess one, one of the kind of constructed things that they're going to do uh, is they're going to define this basis uh, that is a combination of the, the player's plane, uh, the probability matrix that uh, basically ties together the number of possible players, player one type, and the number of possible players of player two type. So this is a, a basically a, a tying together of the bargaining situation X, and the um, and a probability matrix basically determines not necessarily what the players are, but the the, the the probability space that defines the players or what the players could be. And the fourth axiom is going to be that there is a linear transformation between uh, bases uh, that you can transition to in this game. So this is basically going to say that uh, there may be a solution for nonlinear games or transitions that are nonlinear, but so long as this applies, uh, this is going to guarantee that uh, the solution you come up with works. And so this is going to be the thing that uh, kind of future research is probably going to look at. I haven't actually seen whether the future research actually does look at it or not. Uh, but this is the sort of thing that I actually just read something similar uh, relating to quantum physics, where the, this is kind of an assumption that they make in some areas there as well, uh, that uh, things get really weird if this is not the case, and you end up getting things for kind of for free uh, on top of it. So this turns out to be a reasonable uh, assumption in many cases, but in, regardless of whether you agree or not, um, the, the kind of going from, you know, place in the game to other place in the game, uh, expecting that there's kind of this linear relationship uh, certainly makes the, the, the likelihood of proving something like this a lot more uh, tractable. Um, but they make this assumption, and uh, we're going to kind of assume that they had the right idea for doing that. Uh, but again, if you have a problem with the outcome of this, this may be one of the things you may want to poke around with and see what happens when you remove this assumption, just kind of as a for future note. The 
six if the sixth assumption that they're going to make is that if you are at a point in your space and you substitute one player for another player, both players have to agree on what next uh, step to go or the next uh, move to make. And so uh, the not every player is going to be in definable in every space. However, there is going to be uh, for the players that are definable in that space, they have to agree. This basically is the assumption that says this is a unique strategy. This is a unique uh, set of moves that is different from other potential sets of moves that you can make. Uh, because if they were the same, then two people would not, I guess, move differently in that situation. Or two, two strategies are not going to you know, move differently on, on one uh, kind of same set of probabilities, coin flips, uh, etc. So this is kind of a uniqueness thing. sure why this one's an axiom, but uh, that each player, uh, you, you can kind of view this as a, uh, e each player uh, at any point in the space uh, is going to be split into uh, subtypes of that player, and the subtypes of that player, the probabilities of those subtypes has to add to one. Or if there are two of them, you have the probability of the first subtype and the probability of the second subtype is the or one minus the first. So that basically the, at every given point, there is a player. And so it's not that just that there's multiple players and that the players have different probabilities of existing at any given point, but that those have to actually sum up to one. So you're, you're basically, you're, you're building a complete model or you're building a complete uh, set of players so that your, your solution, when it, when it is defined, is defined for the entirety of the space, not just that it falls off of the you know, side of the, the, the model at a certain point. So there, there's no places where you can your path falls into where you no longer exist. Now, this one might be worth criticizing in the event where you know, death is, or mortality or nuclear war is actually an option, because this is actually going to be guaranteed to be false in those cases. Uh, however, it is just an assumption to gather um, an optimum. And of course, most of the, the uh, possible outcomes regarding mortal or mortality and nuclear war probably um, run afoul of one of these other things of the best possible path, or that there's player invariance. So, you know, for example, the combination of these two is basically going to be the Rawlsian, you know, run afoul of something like the Rawlsian Veil. Where you know, if any given player uh, can uh, be killed, uh, then every single player has to agree that their life is not necessarily worth keeping around. Uh, so that that's going to be something that uh, is going to kind of be, make this a little bit more reasonable of a, an assumption than you might otherwise expect. And then the final assumption that he's going to make is that there's the function, or the, which is basically the, the strategy that is going to be optimal, uh, is going to be constrained so that uh, it is
first is that the, the second derivative of our, our space is going to be definable by the first derivative of our player matrix and the bargaining situation. The second is that the second derivative of our player has to be defined in terms of this v. Wait a bit, v from again. Oh, right, the probability vector, uh, sorry, the probability of the players um, uh, sort of relate the, 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 the second derivative of the player matrix to the first derivative of the player matrix to the first uh, player matrix itself. And then the, the third kind of constraint or sub-constraint here is that the function or the strategy, which is what L is, to be the same for the first and second derivatives of the basis space. Um, I'm not going to go into why uh, this is necessary, but uh, that turns out to be the, the necessary constraint on how the, this, this situation can be modeled, such that there ends up only being one function that models all of these axioms together, and that, that follows all of these constraints, and still produces a, a definable function. And that is the one that maximizes what's called the uh, Nash function, which turns out to be actually pretty simple. The solution and the one thing that satisfies all of these assumptions is that the benefit at that point in the, the, the or the benefit of the move or the benefit of, of, of any given action minus the cost for that particular player determines I, I guess a, a value and that the values multiplied together for all players uh, determines a value for, for a move or, or a or thing that you can possibly do. And that the combination of all of those things for any given choice or any given point in the game this actually ends up determining this L, which is our goal strategy. So, uh, summarizing all this up, is you have this entire you know, really restrictive especially in some cases, that there's absolutely no better path. And that it turns out that there is one function that does this, which is the profit maximizing function of benefits minus costs. Th this might be a little bit shocking, but because it seems like this is a little bit really greedy, uh, in, in that it, it doesn't really take into account you know, a long kind of view of information. It doesn't... Um, uh, it's 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 seemingly similar to the, the, the minimax or maximum view of restricting you know your opponent while you know gaining on, on your own and so on and so forth. But their the argument in this paper is that this is the only one that satisfies all of these. If you remove something like linear transformations, you might be able to improve on that. If you remove that, your you know you can you can have different players. You know th this may be impossible. So that there's this kind of fine line between having no possible solution, where you fall into this kind of trench warfare, uh, possible, you know, impossibly bad and impossible to get anything out of situation. Uh, as a worst case, where you have this that will get guarantee you at least the least bad outcome, uh, or or something better. But uh, again, this is a um, kind of a, at a general. You know, looking at the, the state space uh, and the hem space involved, this is as good as you can do.
Now there is a proof given for this, it is highly detailed, uh, but the, the kind of hint to get to the proof, uh, just as an aside, uh, is that it is, it, it is definable by information theory, that you calculate the entropy of the different states, uh, or, or at least the entropy, uh, you define an entropy based on the states you, you know, want to and don't want to get in as different players, and kind of go from there. Uh, it is a long and complicated proof, but since you probably already understand the concept of entropy, you're actually doing much better than you know, Parsani had uh, at the time. Uh, yeah, economics and game theory uh, did not really use entropy as a concept, and didn't really discuss it in terms of entropy in the paper, although the equations are all the same. And so you can kind of go from there, define this based on a view of the system employing uh, or at least minimizing entropy. Uh, and then a final note uh, is that you can agree with this, and you can agree with this solution and whether or not to commit based on it, uh, with still disagreeing on the particulars that this solution comes up with. So for example, uh, it may be that you know uh, for particular bits of information that this model does not know or that you can't get into the model where you can get it into a situation where you'll still do something that the model disagrees with. You'll still choose not to follow this model in, 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 in some cases, but this is actually the model that determines what level of commitment is optimal. So, um, again, it, it, it's, there, there's, there's kind of care to be taken with that. But going back to the first video, uh, if you remember, the, the this is going to determine uh, strategies to employ uh, at a certain level, but your strategies that you wish to employ can be definable within that. So, for example, um, if, if there's a certain, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're basically going to determine by coin costs uh, which, which sub-strategies to employ, uh, but you still get to choose the sub-strategies. So, um, the, the thing that you're probably going to want to, to sink your teeth in is not necessarily this, but it's going to be the sub-strategies that uh, are fed into something that this is going to work on and work upon. So, uh, in summary, uh, we have all these axioms that we've defined, that it has to be profitable, uh, that it has to follow the best path, that it's player invariant, that there's no possible uh, better path from that path, that linear transformations are, are the only transformations that are, uh, I, I guess, possible or definable in the space, that there's no better path by substituting the players, that the players uh, have to be definable on all spaces, and that there's no uh, kind of mortality involved, uh, and this kind of extra um, relationship between the derivatives of the possible players and the derivatives of the possible space and the function or solution involved, and uh, that this ends up being kind of summarizable in terms of profit minus cost. So there you go. Uh, everything going back to this kind of business view uh, of, of reality, but hopefully this is something that, that gives justification to that. Um, again, this has been Jeff Cliff, and This has been 10 Ideas 50 Years. If you have any questions or if you want to you know, go into the proof as for why these are uh, the way they are, uh, feel free to ask on any thread that this is posted in. Uh, hopefully I've got the details right on this one. Uh, it's a little bit simplified, so it shouldn't be too far from the case uh, or, or from what they were trying to get across. Um, but again, this is uh, the, the, the proofs kind of get a little dicey in places. So uh, feel free to ask questions, and we'll see you next video.